when I was coming along today, I, I, there was never any doubt it was coming along. I, um, I was looking forward to coming along. However, um, I was really, I was really getting quite vexed about what I was going to speak about, what I was going to say, because I seem to have been saying the same thing now for about a decade and a bit. And I'm really getting hacked off with it. It's the truth of the matter. And my wife reckons now that I'm 65 that I'm getting a little bullshier than I was before. And I was quite bullshy before. Um, because I'm at that so what stage. I really am getting to that stage of, of, of getting annoyed about things. About getting annoyed at, um, about lack of shift, about words that are said that are weaselly and, and, and mean bugger all and think we're stupid. Uh, and treat us as if we're silly, and that, that really, that's beginning to bug me more than it ever did before. So over the next few months I'm going to get louder about things, not just this, but other things. And so I was, I was thinking about what it might be, and, 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 and Tam had said to me at the start, how do we want introduced, and, and uh, we had both independently said, don't be saying anything, we'll be fine. Because um, mostly, you know, mostly my job now is George's grandfather. That's it. Anita's wife, uh, husband, I mean, Anita said hello sometimes. Uh, Anita's, Anita's husband has been with Anita's husband for 44, 40, uh, 44 years. Uh, um, Rachel's father and, and Laura's father. And then the main, those are the things that, that, that really are left. Because I don't have a job title anymore. And I think part of the challenge that we have for ourselves, and I think this is what I'm going to end up speaking about, is, is that we have over the past few decades relied on systems, we've relied on processes and structures to do things for us. And we've forgotten the power that, that systems change at an individual level. If there was a system to change, it would have been changed, trust me. I know lots of folk who are really smart, they're in this room. We would have pulled the lever, it would have been done. No politician starts off not wanting to make it worse, they start off wanting to make it better. If there was a lever, it would be pulled. Right, so what I want to speak about is not the what it is we want to do, because what we want to do is, is straightforward. Why we want to do it? Well, the evidence is just overwhelming. The question we should be asking is why are we not doing it? Not why should we do it, but why are we not doing it? And that's sometimes the question we need to, to, to be asking. And, and that's a bit more a question on the front foot, you know? That's a bit more a proactive question than a why shouldn't we do this? If you get some civil servants in, and with all due respect to civil, there are some great civil servants, civil servants will find 350 ways why you shouldn't be doing it. There's no problem finding out how not to do things. The challenge is finding out why we should. And, and um, I started off in the police and, and too much violence and started working my way back down to think why are we dealing with all this nonsense when we could be doing something up here, and that was my journey. Um, and, and when we started doing that and we, we discovered stuff, like adverse childhood experiences. I thought, obviously, obviously people don't know about this. Obviously people don't realise the impact that this has. Or we'd be doing something about it. <laughs> Jesus, how naive was that, you know? <laughs> the worrying thing is I was deputy head of the CID at the time and investigated murder for a living. And I was so incredibly naive. So the first thing I learned is people won't do the right thing simply because it's the right thing. They just won't. So don't live in that naive world that it's going to happen. It ain't. You can do it because you can do it for yourselves. That's that individual level. John Swinney, John Swinney's one of the smartest politicians I've ever met in my life. He gets it. So when John Swinney can't pull the lever, you have to start thinking about, well, how, how are we going to do that? And, and the challenge then is, and, and these are just some random things. Sometimes I think, um, when, it, when you were speaking about play, um, one of the things we've done in this country is we're one of the most consumerist nations in the world. And we've turned play into that. I mean, I, I, my youngest daughter, who's George's mum, lives in a nice new estate, uh, um, a persimmons home, it's very nice. Um, <laughs> and there's a, a little play park opposite it. Because we created a play park, and there's a couple of swings and a roundabout, and we shoot. But there's no el anywhere else where kids can play. Just there. That's it. You want to play? Play in there. They count the grass verges as green ground. They count the grass verges and the roundabouts as the percentage of green ground the planners are required to put in. That's what they do. And when I was driving up last night to, to take Georgia back home, um, here are two or three kids 
at the side of a house, playing with a ball, kicking the ball off the house. And I'm thinking, folk will be going nuts. Bloody kids. You know, there's no ball game sign I'll go up any minute now. So we, we still, and then when I'm, when I'm in our back garden and I look around, there's a bouncy castle, uh, a, a trampoline in that garden, there's a trampoline over in that garden over there, and there's a trampoline over there. Probably cost 200 quid each, but we'll have them and put them in the back garden. There's another big frame there that's got a wee fort on it. So I should say there's no kids bouncing on this when I'm there. And there, there, there are no, um, there's no kids playing in the castle in the, this lady thing that's in the garden next door. I'm not there. So we think plays about buying stuff and, and where we do it. And yet, when Georgia comes into our house, and she's got wee buyer toys as well, she plays mainly right now it's with coasters. And she's trying to find <laughs> out the noise that coasters may see and do they bounce. And the ceramic coasters, they don't bounce. <laughs> <laughs> And we have a wooden floor, they really make marks on it. You know, she's trying to do that stuff. Our mum was telling me this morning, over FaceTime this morning, her latest trick is, we, we, she's a year old, just over a year. So we've got her now, when, when, before she goes into her bath, when her nappy's off, we sit on her potty and we go, yeah, she's done it, yo, there you go. Um, but now she's playing with the potty, so she sits on herself and looks around and then, and then gets up and has a look to see what's there. And it's just <laughs> absolutely. So she puts things in and out at now, she puts little building. So, the idea of toys, it's just that exactly what you were saying. I mean, no matter how many ta toys we, that are there, which is fine, she's just, she's just no up for that. Um, it just doesn't seem to be what she's doing. And it seems, it seems to me that we can't look at this in isolation. We need to look at what we're speaking about in the, in, in the wider context of things that are happening. If we want this to be the best place in the world to grow up, and we don't want that just to become that nonsensical catchphrase that means bugger all. <laughs> Because right now it doesn't mean a great deal. Because you know, I, I like Sir Michael Marron was up and said, if you want to make it the best place in the world to grow up, then do that. <laughs> do that. You've enough smart folk. There's enough evidence around the world that's there. Just do it. Just get on with it. You know that Nike one. Just do it. But so we need to work out why we're not doing it. And there, there's a quote which I always keep in the back of this. I transfer it in everyone, and it's from The Prince by Machiavelli. I'll just get this is only four I've got. The rest of the stuff is all mine. Um, <laughs> it must be remembered that there is nothing more difficult to plan, more doubtful of success, nor more dangerous to manage than a new order of things. For the initiator has the enmity of all who would profit by the preservation of the old institution and merely lukewarm defenders and those who gain by the new ones. So don't underestimate how difficult this is to change. It's really, really difficult. When you think about it in terms of early years, and I've been shouting about early years for a while, early years is still the least valued workforce. It's the place where parents come in and watch kids play and grandparents come in and aunts and uncles and pick their kids up and know the teachers. And then as soon as they go to primary school, they have to make an appointment to see the teacher and the first day they have to leave the kids at the gate. This is the new world. This is what's happened to you now. I didn't know about the baskets, that's really concerning. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you this, it's, it, it, it's four and a bit years before Georgia goes to school because she'll not be going at four and a bit. Uh, um, there won't be any baskets involved in it. <laughs> <laughs> or it'll not be Georgia, will be wearing it. Um, but sometimes I think what, what we do is, and it's, that, it's maybe that consumerism thing, I don't, I, I, I'm not sure, and these are unformed thoughts, but it's that idea that sometimes I think we're preparing our children to earn a living as opposed to preparing our children to live a life. And we think both are entirely different. We think there's something different about that. Where the truth of the matter is, if we, if we, if we allow our children to learn to live a life, all the other stuff would happen, the education stuff would happen. And if we look at education all the way back, I mean, there's only, I think there's 52 or 53 percent of graduates are working, in, are, are working in jobs where they're using their degree. The rest are not. We're talking about we don't have enough nurses. We have to bring nurses in. I don't want to get into any Brexit. But I mean, why am I not asking the question, why do we not have enough nurses? Is there, is there young people out there who actually don't want to be nurses? Is it not attractive enough? Is it to do with the money? Is it, well, what's the story? Why do we not have them? We ask the wrong questions. We go for the, for the quick fix with that. So I think we need to start uh, getting, them to be, um, getting them to be ready for life. And I think the other challenge as well for us, and there's loads of challenges. Oh, I like to tell you there's great news in this, there's not. Um, the other challenge is, what we're talking about is universal change. We're talking about universal shift. So we're not talking about 
that we identify group. If we do this for this wee group here, we'll, we'll, we'll change things. So the adverse childhood experiences, for instance, if you have the adverse childhood experiences, you know, and, and as Scots, we're fabulous at defining all the bad stuff, all the stuff that makes us unhealthy. We're really good at that. We put a pile of research into that. We're not quite so hard at defining the stuff and researching the stuff that makes us healthy. Play makes us healthy. The research is there for that. So when we're talking about ACEs, we say, well, we need to help those children, and here's how you identify those children. The cohort we're talking about for this is everybody. It's everybody. And we all have ACEs. We keep forgetting that. And we're, we're now starting to think, you know, you oh, ACEs is a silver bullet. No, it's not. Neither is playing a silver bullet. But all of these things together, we start to pull them together and understand a bit more. And, I, you know, I, I, I said it, and, and Julie and I did the film to launch it, and I kept saying, follow the evidence. What does the evidence say? And if the evidence says A, and you're not doing A, you need a reason why you're not doing it. <laughs> and we haven't even got to that stage yet. Nobody's actually said, this is why we are not doing this. Nobody said it's the wrong thing to do. Nobody said it's good to test four and a half. Well, some people have said it's good to test four and a half. Um, nobody, th there's no benefit in that. And we're challenging that. And I think in the how, and as individuals, we need to start challenging these things. Don't expect other people to do it. They ain't going to do it. You need to pick a fight. Rights on your side. That's what we need to do. We need to get far bullshier about it. I had, I had the UNICEF, the, the general principles down, but you've already, you know, there's a, there's a right. No, that's absolute kindness. It, it, means, it means I'm right with somebody who's smart, which is reassuring. It's always reassuring. You know, that, I always had that expression, if you're the smartest guy in the room, Get into another room. <laughs> I always did that. I always was in a room where there were smarter people than me. Fabulous. Stole their ideas. Did that all the time. Uh, you know, like Suzanne at the back, for instance. Suzanne's uh, the, the, the answer to every question is relationships, relationships, relationships. Now, that's straightforward and simple. Sometimes too simple. And sometimes you'll have uh, politicians a bit wary of that and, and the movers and shakers a bit wary because it can't it be that easy? They think a complex problem requires a complex solution. They think a wicked problem rely on something that's really complicated and complex. And sometimes it's not that at all. And it's really important. And the other thing, because it's that cohort for everyone, the idea, for instance, of not children not going into that formal educational classroom set <coughs> at seven, if we say, and I've said it myself to friends, because I'm everything I meet, do it to uh, um, they get a glass of wine to, they normally can't go anywhere. If they're at home, they're at my house, I've captured them. Um, you can have a glass of wine, but you need to listen to this. Uh, um, it's like timeshare salesman stuff. Um, when, when I say to them, you know, or upstart, yeah, I, I, was, I was in Peebles yesterday, for instance. It's the Belton at Peebles. And I go down every year, my wife and I, to friends down there, every, uh, uh, every year for the past 20 odd years, to friends. He's a wine dealer. It's a really good place to go. And, um, and he's a musician. He's a session musician, so it's a great place. So what we're talking, and I said, oh, I'm, I'm, tomorrow I'm, I'm going to pay off him, pay off Upstart, EGM. What's upstart? Oh, I said, oh, oh, very, very briefly, we, <laughs> we think kids go to school too early. And, and you, could see, you could see that, you know, there were about five or six in the group we were talking about. And I said, whoa, whoa, I, I don't mean you have to stay at home with you. <laughs> 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 but believe me, there, are, there is a huge, I think, majority of parents who want their kids to get out of the house as quickly as they possibly can so they can get back to work and pay the mortgage and all the other stuff. And it's usually mum has to get back to work and a low paid bloody job. And if we really were, uh, um, if we really did want this to be the best place in the world to grow up, then we'd be saying, what do we need to do? If you value children, as we claim we do, we need to value parents. So therefore you would have two years, two years leave. Now when you say that, Friend just went, oh, how would you pay for that? They immediately go to that place where here's the reasons you can't do it. Well, we need to start and very quietly speak about, well, let's just dream the dream for a minute or two. Let's just imagine. Let's just imagine that that was the right thing to do. And let's imagine we wanted to do it. What would it look like? How much would it cost? Let's think it through. And then if you design it, you think, well, OK, we've thought it through. It's too expensive to do right now. It's the right thing to do. So let's do this. And in 10 years' time, we might manage to do that. But right now, the default setting is can't afford it because the value is money. 
the values jobs, the values, that's what we do. So we need to shift the values and that's that individual thing as well. Um, so the, the, the challenge that everybody's in the same, same boat, you're all here on a sunny Sunday afternoon. It's not the usual CPD, you know? You've got to see, I, I speak up lots of stuff and it's a day out <laughs> for most people. But, you know, you, and, and if it's organised in the city centre and you're speaking after lunch, there's not as many people there because they disappear to do a bit of shrunk in Glasgow tomorrow. I'll get that when I'm at that course. Um, you don't see them again. But here it's... So, you're already committed to this. You already understand this. This is why you're here. You're already up for it. We need to convince other people to be up for it. If we each of us went out here and signed on another two people and convinced them of this, and then they signed on two people, and they signed on two people, that's how movements start. And Tam spoke about it. That's what we need to be doing. Don't think... Because that's when you'll have politicians shifting. Because politicians can either lead or follow public opinion. Most times they follow public opinion. Look at the chaos we're in right now with public opinion when it gets to the 4951 part. It's chaotic. So we need to get to the stage where they're a bit chaotic about that as well. About actually thinking about and seriously considering the notion that, well, maybe this is the right thing to do. Maybe we should be doing that. Now, experts have been telling them about it. Experts who understand the evidence and they've not managed to convince them but at least they've started the conversation. It's for us now to take that conversation forward, to create that movement, that mass that says, well, this is the obvious thing to do. So that in some manifesto in five years' time, it'll say, if we get any power, we're going to raise the formal schooling age to six, and we're going to have that extra year as a kindergarten where children can play and develop, because that's what the evidence tells us. And if it works okay in 10 years' time, we'll have it up to seven. And we'll really be going with it. We will, we will be able to say and speak about Canada and Finland and Holland and these places and stand alongside them, not aspire to them, but work alongside them and develop what we're trying to do. But we need to do that ourselves. Um, we need to link into the professionals because um, m m lots of my stuff around violence is about gangs. And, and <coughs> there is a there's striking similarity between the territorialism and behaviour of youth gangs and health and social work and police gangs <laughs> because they're territorial, they do the same things. <laughs> they think they're the right people, they've got their own language, they keep other folk out, that they've got the answer to it. Their first loyalty is to themselves, it's not to anybody else. You know, it's, it's about that. So when, uh, uh, so if you're expecting everybody to just do, that's the Machiavelli quote ever day to do that. Their first loyalty is in here, first of all. That's how they start. Intellectually, over a glass of wine at the weekend with their friends, they will discuss, yeah, it's not the right thing to do. But they're highly likely going to cha challenge it from within the system. It's difficult for them to do that. Some brave souls do, but they do get it. So we need to encourage these professionals as well that have that to start to speak out about it, to say, look, there's things we can do better. It doesn't have to be like this. We can make things a bit better. Why don't we try this? We just walk people slowly towards the light. Because it, it, it is, some people are startled by the light. There's, there's reasons why they don't do it. And I think as well, and, and, and Julia mentioned it as well, I had written down, please still consider frivolous, meaningless, and a luxury. When in fact, it's the opposite of all of those things. But, but that's how we do so. That language and how we speak about it. We need to start and get that message out there. If we know, tell others. You know, knowledge is no power. It's what you do with the knowledge that's the power. That's where the power lies. That's where we can make changes. And you should never underestimate, you know that tall story that, that history is made up of an infinitesimally large, uh, an infinitely large number of infinitesimally small actions. That's how change happens. That's how history is made. It's not made by the John Swinney's. It's, no, it's made by us. It's made by, you know, the teacher or the head teacher who does something a wee bit different in the school. Who, who makes it a bit different by the nursery teacher, by the parent who does a wee bit, something a wee bit different. And I think it's important. And the example you're having right now with the testing is a, is a great way to start to get this back up, to get it on the agenda, to speak about it. Because there's something you can do about that, I'm sure. Uh, uh, Sue will speak more about it, but there's something you can actually do about that. You can actually say, no, we're up to now. We're not doing that. The, now, if, if 250 people opt out of that, Education Scotland are going to go, it's so cool. just going there. But if 25,000 families opt out of it, they're going to start thinking, hi, about... Because while Education Scotland sees parents, politicians see votes. And that's how you need to think of these things. 
that's how we need to change these things over. So if we can do something, you know that, start where you are and do what you can. doesn't matter what it is, how small it is, don't worry about it. If we can actually just change it overnight, we'd do it. But we can't. We just need to get on with that. Um, and, and the other thing about, I think, um, the, the play is, it's fabulous. <laughs> you know, it does, you know, that makes you feel good. I, I, um, I, I play a lot of golf, it doesn't always make me feel good. It um, impresses me a bit. Um, but, but there is that notion of, and I don't know if it's a, if it's a, if it's a Scottish thing, I used to say the Calvin gene, but the Calvinists get really upset at that because apparently they're no all you know, straight laced. And, um, but th there's something about us. Why is it we don't like to be enjoying ourselves? You know, you know, you know, kids laughing and playing football, and we don't like the idea because they're a bit noisy. We, we don't enjoy the laughter. Um, and I've said for a long time, and I think Tam said it as well. In, in Scotland, we, we actually don't like kids. We tolerate. Them. And until we get beyond the like and into the loving, the other stuff's going to be really difficult. But we can each do it. We can each do it. But I know that was a bit random, uh, um, because I'm fed up telling all the other stuff is there. I mean, we've made the case. It's, uh, we need to get on with it. So thanks for everything you've done so far. Uh, uh, if you haven't done it, get on with it. We'll be back and asking why. Um, <laughs> Challenge, stand in front of the times, ask the difficult questions, be the critical friend, speak the uncomfortable truth, and just say it out loud. And not just to, you, not just to those who are already committed to it, speak to the ones who are not. Point them in the right direction, make them ask questions, ask questions of them, and we'll be back and we'll have made a difference. Thanks very much.